Greetings to you from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. A warm welcome on this, the fourth Sunday after Pentecost, as we continue our season of growth and discipleship, and as we move through the summertime. So a warm welcome to everyone, and also to this weekend is 4th of July weekend, so we give thanks to God for our nation, the liberty and the gifts that this country provides, as well as wishing and praying for safe travels for any of you that are going out traveling, <clears throat> any of you lighting Roman candles also. <clears throat> um, also, um, I have to remind you that next week will be a congregational meeting. We will have two sessions, one after the 8.15 and the second after the 10 o'clock liturgy. You should have received a, a, what they call snail mail, you know, where it comes in an envelope, you open it, and a mail carrier brings it to your house. I know it's old-fashioned. Uh, you might have also received an electronic version, and you've heard it announced twice, so we have met every constitutional requirement. Right, Bethany? Yes, okay, good. Just making sure. I, it, it'll be a good meeting. I don't foresee it being, you know, it's just going to be very informative, uh, part of the transparency process, uh, sharing with you some results of the audit and where we're going forward, um, and also uh, to share discussion on insurance, which is our all our favorite topic, right? So we really, uh, you know, that's how it goes. So please join us for that congregational meeting. Is there any other announcements? Okay, after our prelude, we will begin with the, our entrance hymn, and right now we let us prepare for worship. Stand for our entrance hymn, Thy Strong Word 511.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O God, the Father of our Lord Jesus, you are the city that shelters us, the mother who comforts us. With your spirit, accompany us on our life's journey, that we may spread your peace in all the world. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You be seated. And I'm going to ask the children to come forward for a brief, brief time here. If you want to, you can. Just because you're wearing an elf doesn't keep you out of that. Wow, that's a pro purple dress. Wow. Hi, Finn, how are you? Good. Good to see you. So I know you all went home and been studying your small catechisms with your parents, right? Okay. Well, we can do that. So today we're going to be talking about five other commandments, the second table. And the first one is the fourth commandment, which is, take a guess. Dad, what's the fourth commandment? Oh. <laughs> exactly. That one should be embraced upon every parent's memory and mouth. Right? That's the one to go to when they begin to talk back, but I know none of these kids do because they're very young and still respectful. But God wants us to honor our mothers and our fathers because God says he has given them mothers and fathers to stand in his stead, to teach us about God's word, to help us to pray, to treat res people respectfully. And therefore, he goes on to say, Luther says, we are supposed to talk respectfully to our parents. We're not to you know, challenge or talk back. And then Luther says in that catechism, it's not just our mothers and our fathers, but how many are in school? How many of you like your teachers? Well, I shouldn't have asked that question. But next, God has given us teachers to give us instruction, and we're supposed to respect them also. And then he goes on and talks about, and I know this is really a hard one for some people, government. Government is another way in which God structures and makes his presence known to protect innocence, and to serve godly purposes. But he also admits that many governments don't do that. And that's why in the larger catechism, he encourages the church to train pious leaders, both concentrate on their secular learning, but also on their character development, their development of faith, so that leaders in public service can be examples and witnesses to God and God's will in the public realm. So, that's a lot of things, right? To honor and to respect. But unfortunately, because of sin, we sometimes get honorary. Have you ever said something to your mom and dad that you shouldn't have said? No? Yeah, Joe. <laughs> or they ask you to clean the room, and what do you say? I'm busy. And worse yet, well, why don't you clean it if it's such a concern? Ooh. Ouch. Well, when we do that, we need to go back to them and say, Mom, Dad, I'm really sorry, and I ask your forgiveness, as we would ask forgiveness from God. And then there's also a warning to parents that you should not treat your children to the point of where they rebel also. So that goes both ways, that mutual respect. So Luther's fourth catechism, fourth commandment. And since we were talking about government, what is today? Well, what's tomorrow? Fourth of July. So what does Fourth of July stand for? In, from, the, from Britain and the United Kingdom, right. We're celebrating the birth of our nation, and we give thanks to God, and we pray for God to continue to guide and bless us also this weekend. Okay? So, keep working on that catechism, because by the time you get to confirmation, it'll be a breeze then. Okay? 
Let us pray. The Lord be with you. Gracious God, we give thanks to you for our mothers and our fathers, for our parents and those who nurture and care for us. Help us to be respectful of our parents no matter how young or how old we are and to remember that you have sent them to us as a blessing. We also pray for our country. We pray for our leaders and we pray for the gift of freedom and liberty that you have given us, that we remember that we might treasure it always and not take it for granted. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Okay. You go back to your seats or... The first reading comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 12 through 16, and it's part three of the Ten Commandments series. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. of the Holy Gospel. Just a reminder, and I know some of you are saying, that Gospel again? It continues for this series. The Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is recorded by St. Matthew, the 24th chapter. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that hour, day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son of Man, but only the Father. For as in the days of Noah were so, will it be when the coming of man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will it be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be left in the field, one will be taken, and one will be left. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Now, this is supposed to be part three of the continuing series on the Ten Commandments. There is a typo in the bulletin. And just for some of you that were thinking I was going to repeat last week again because it was so important, that is not the case. We will be moving on. So part three. And this is entitled Trying to Live Horizontally, okay? The Ten Commandments show us how a liberated people who have been freed by Jesus Christ from the powers of sin, the world, and self, are called to live a new life. Now, many young, many modern people these days, and you may count yourself among them, regard freedom as an end in and of itself. And it's fitting that we, on this 4th of July weekend, begin to reflect on freedom, the gift of freedom. And to look at these remaining, believe me, five commandments to try to preach through, there's a lot there, but I plan on framing them within four proposals of freedom for the Christian life. And it is going to take a little bit of time, so please bear with me. So I have a question. If you ask somebody today, what is freedom for, what answers would you get? you think? Yes. Life, liberty, and pursuit of justice. Good. Okay. Probably get a whole bunch of answers, maybe some silence like I'm getting now, because we really don't know what freedom is. We may think we do, but it's kind of nebulous at times, unfortunately. But if you really want to ask a question, 
a very profound question concerning freedom. It is the following. What is that free, what is that free people may not ever do? What is that free people may not ever do? Pardon? Commit crime. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. I'm glad you had an answer because I did try this question as a man on the street interview. I got blank looks, stares like, what's this guy in that funny collar talking about? And then I did get that one common answer among young people, whatever. I still haven't figured that response out yet. But this is a modern dilemma for us. And as I have framed the argument and the background of these Ten Commandments as natural law, in contrast to the dilemma of the authentic self as being the criteria for all our behavior action and literally the expressive self in action, freedom sometimes is very well misunderstood. And when you combine the quest for the authentic self with another philosoph philosophy of life, another ethical system called universalism, it gets even a little bit more complicated or crazy if you think about it. The system called utilitarian, utilitarianism, excuse me, I got my, I, was, I said universalism, Unitarian, utilitarianism, is where basically it says sometimes it's defined as the ends justify the means. Whatever you do to get to the final goal is worth doing. But in the context of Mills and also another ethical philosopher by the name of Henry Sedgwick, who wrote a philosophy of hedonism, he goes on to say, following that is, whatever more, it, that is whatever morally gives the most pleasure and happiness to the most persons involved is the standard by which we are to live. Pleasure and happiness. This stands in contrast to the divine commandments, what are bestowing, what the commandments and how they bestow freedom and what freedom looks like for us. In living in the second table of the Ten Commandments, we are learning to live horizontally. And last week we learned what, how to live vertically in our relationship with God, and now we are going to live, to live horizontally. Vertically, horizontally. Vertically, horizontally. Vertically, horizontally. Do you see something in common here? What stands in the course of all freedom is Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus' forgiveness and grace empowers us to live horizontally, and how to love our neighbor. And this 4th of July weekend, I do want to frame the gift of freedom for Christian living, living horizontally, in light of the second table of the Ten Commandments. First, freedom is not when the powerful take what they want, but when we respect the property of others, and we do our best to help them maintain it and to retain it. This refers to the seventh commandment. You shall not steal. Luther writes, after your own person and your spouse, the next thing God wants to be protected is temporal property. And he has commanded us that, that us all not rob or plunder our neighbor's possessions through any unjust means. He goes on to write, let all people know then that it is their duty on the pain of God's displeasure not to harm their neighbors, to take advantage of them, to defraud them by any faithless or underhanded business transaction. He is presenting to us in the large catechism business ethics. Much more, he goes on to say, they are obligated and faithfully to protect their neighbor's property and to promote and further their interests especially when they get money, wages, and provisions for doing so. He also goes on to talk about government and the role of government. 
policy by means of social policy and not by government coercion or action, but by one's heart, quoting Proverbs 19.17. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord and will be repaid in full. Here you have a rich Lord who is surely sufficient for your needs and will let you lack nothing. Thus will a happy conscience, with a happy conscience, you can enjoy a hundred times more than you could scrape together by pitrophy and injustice. Second, freedom is not when the strong dominate the weak, but when the bodies of all lives, from the unborn to the impoverished to the handicapped to the vulnerable to the elderly, all people are to be protected and their rights respected. This begins and connects with commandments four and five. The fourth commandment, you shall honor your father and your mother. Sounds simple, right? Easy enough. But it is with the family where it all begins, where learning respect begins. And without family, social stability is impossible. Because without it, the passing on of values, of society values and Christian values, according to Luther, from one generation to another is impossible. And nothing comes close to the family in giving children a secure and stable childhood. Luther writes, God has given us this walk of life, fatherhood and motherhood. He uses that phrase, walk of life, to refer to parenting, as well as to marriage, and as well as to ministry, the various estates of our lives. He has given this walk of life, fatherhood and motherhood, a special position of honor, higher than that of any other walk of life under it. Moreover, he writes, he offers this lesson to children and offers a lifelong lesson and only if we adults could follow this. Behave respectfully toward them, and do not speak discour discouragingly up to them, to criticize them, or to take them to task, but rather submit to them and hold your tongue. That is good sound advice, whether you're a small child or an adult in the workplace, in the larger society. Also connected to the second point of freedom is the fifth commandment, you shall not murder. It is not kill. Luther goes to the Hebrew source, and the Hebrew word here is for murder. That means to take a life unjustly. It is a commandment that is broken by comm omission as well as commission. In other words, you can break this commandment by actively doing it, intentionally doing it, or by just not doing something that enables it to happen. And just one special note of clarification regarding this commandment, thou shalt not murder. It does not apply to the government. For it is in the government's right to punish heinous crimes, as well as to have a military. Those are not covered by this commandment. And that's a whole other discussion on the doctrine of the two kingdoms. Luther is very explicit this commandment applies to individuals. Also, he notes that if we have the ability to prevent a death, and we do not prevent it, we are guilty also of that person's death, just as we have put a knife in their back. Neglect the hungry, the naked, the sick, the innocent of society. Luther uses this illustration. If a naked, freezing person comes to your door and knocks on it, seeking shelter, clothing, and food, and you turn them away because you cannot do so, or you refuse to do so, and he goes out and freezes to death, you are culpable for his murder. Living horizontally. Loving our neighbor. Luther says the meaning of this commandment is that we, no one shall harm another person for any evil deed. 
no matter how much that person deserves it. For wherever, where, for where murder is forbidden, there is also forbidden everything that may lead to murder. And Luther, in his wonderful way of working through the large catechism, and there's much he writes on each of these commandments, has a way of going ahead and peeling the layers of the onion. Because there is none of us that are going to stand there saying, yeah, I'm innocent in all of this. Because it always points back to Christ and our need of Christ, of forgiveness, grace, and back to that first commandment. I am the Lord your God. He writes, many people, although they do not actually commit murder, nevertheless curse others and wish such frightful things on them that if they were true to come true, they would soon put an end to them. Our thoughts, our speech has consequences. Everyone acts in this way by nature. Therefore, God wishes to remove the root and the source that embitters the human heart toward their neighbor. God wants us to train us to hold on to this commandment always before our eyes as a mirror in which we see ourselves so that we may be attentive to his will and with heartfelt confidence and prayer in his name commit whatever wrong we suffer to God. Then we can let our enemies rave and rage and do their worst. This is the point I really like that Luther made. Thus, we may learn to calm our anger and have a patient, gentle heart, especially towards those who cause us to be angry. Think how better our lives would be if we were able to manifest that. Third proposition. Freedom is not the endless satisfaction of every sexual impulse that commit, but the commitment of two people to each other. Christian freedom knows that within the bonds of a loving and committed marriage, there is more freedom to be experienced in here than there is in, in this lifestyle that does not commit to a family. The sixth commandment, you shall not commit adultery. Now, warning on this section, there is a NC-17 warning. There is an old joke about the Sixth Commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. Moses comes down from Mount Sinai and announces, I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is I got them down to ten. The bad news is adultery stays. Yeah, we chuckle on that one. And that is telling. The prohibition on a married person having sexual relations with anyone except his or her spouse may be for many the most difficult of the Ten Commandments to observe. And the reasons for that shouldn't be too hard to guess. Yet, for many in today's society, and many voices in our society and culture today, marriage represents a repressive and old-fashioned morality. Marriage, the nuclear family, we are told, needs to be done away with. What matters is my own, our own sexual identity and the freedom to express that without the restraint of marriage. If you have any doubts, one of my little dirt, guilty pleasures is when I'm standing in the line at the grocery store, I love to look at the National Enquirer or the National Examiner, or the Star, because there's always some salacious headline, especially around Christmas and Easter, it usually has to do with Jesus and Elvis, which I just find fascinating. But if you don't think our society is moving in such a direction, has been for a long time, just look at the cover, Jane Seymour, 71, My Wild and Crazy Life. Who wouldn't like to have a wild and crazy life with Jane Seymour? Four nasty divorces. Lust with Dr. Quinn's co-star. But then this is the one that got me. Even the Andy Griffith show, Mayberry RFD, 
the most wholesome show, the most Americana show. I mean, they even take a tack at that. Look, Andy Griffith show, Secrets and Scandals. Who Hates Who? Vicious Fights. Affairs. Booze. You know, there's also a personal ad in the back of the Inquirer for dating. I don't know if I would want to date anybody who reads that, especially, you know, I don't know. For many of us in our culture, and as I said when I first presented this series on the Ten Commandments, many of us don't read the major philosophers and big thinkers. We might touch them in college, maybe in graduate school a little bit, and we may think on initial reading they're just crazy, but somehow those crazy ideas begin to take fruit in society through literature, through higher education, through public life, through expression of the individual. The voice of Freud, Sigmund Freud, runs very deep. That ha human happiness is the decision to seek pleasure and avoid pain. He writes in his work of civilization and its disconnect, dis discontents. Now hold your ears here. Man's discovery that sexual genitalia love afforded him the greatest experience of satisfaction and in fact provided him with a prototype of all happiness. And that humans should make genital eroticism the central point of life. And he goes on to write, the primitive man was better off in knowing no restrictions on instinct. Sound kind of familiar? But another very influential figure, and I would say if you ever studied him or read about him, you would say he's clearly off the reservation to excuse the expression. From the 1930s, he had a career in Germany and Norway and in the United States where he settled in New York City at the New School. This person's, this psychologist was a a uh, student of Freud, later got contact with Marx, as well as the sociologists of the Frankfurt School. His name is Wil Wilhelm Reich, R-E-I-C-H. And he writes some of the most outrageous things that unfortunately have become very normative for our culture and society today with regard to marriage, with regard to sexuality, with regard to our lives as a whole. In some circles, he's known as the father of the sexual revolution. A little piece of trivia. Have many of you ever remember that 1968 really bad B movie, Barbarella? It's based on his life and teachings. He was praised in the village voice in lectures at Columbia University and the Ivy League schools. Reich writes in his work entitled The Sexual Revolution Toward Self-Regulating Character Structure the following. The existence of strict moral principles has invariably signified that the biological and specifically sexual needs of man were not being satisfied. Every moral regulation in itself is sex negating, and all compulsory morality is life negating. He went on to write in some of his writings talking about even putting limits on sexual instruction for young children was immoral, and society and family should have no room in that. He said that marriage was an authoritarian institution. We do hear those voices today, don't we? For Reich, and in a world where sexual needs are foundational to identity, that means identities are supposed to be, are being suppressed and denied by moral laws, structures of family, and especially the Ten Commandments. But when this happens according to this line of thinking, what is needed according to the modern ethos is not just to change those principles or merely loosen them or reinterpret them, 
It is to abolish them in their entirety. And this does rub against God's intention as expressed in the Sixth Commandment by Luther. Luther writes, Where where nature functions as God implanted it, however, it is not possible to remain chaste outside of marriage. For flesh and blood and natural inclinations and stimulations proceed unrestrained and unimpeded as everyone observes and experiences. God established marriage so that all may have their allotted portion and be satisfied with it. Although here, too, God's grace is still required to keep the heart pure. He writes further, Married life is not a matter for jest or idle curiosity, but it is a glorious institution, an object of God's serious concern. We should not despise or disdain this walk of life. It was established before all others, as the first of all institutions, with that command, be fruitful and multiply, given in the garden. This commandment speaks of the person nearest to them, the most important thing to them after their own life, namely their spouse, who is one in flesh and blood with them. With respect to no other blessings, can one do them greater harm than here? It is expressly forbidden here to dishonor another's marriage partner. Fourth, and lastly, freedom, while we have been given, may have been given constitutional right to say hurtful and even untrue things about our neighbor. God, however, desires us to use our tongues carefully to build up and not destroy another's character the Eighth Commandment. You shall not bear false witness. How we speak, how we use our words, how we construct our words is a way of serving and loving our neighbor, the art of minding one's tongue. In this discussion, and I don't mean to offend any lawyers here, he takes on what are called the jurists, who love to play with words and bend the truth to certain things and to change language. He warns against that strongly. And Luther writes concerning the Eighth Commandment, besides our own body, our spouse, and our temporal property, we have one more treasure that is indispensable to us, namely our honor, good reputation, our character. Therefore, God does not want our neighbors deprived of their reputation, their honor, or their character, any more of their money or possessions. In summary, no one shall use the tongue to harm a neighbor, whether friend or foe. No one shall say anything evil, even if it's true, hmm, of one's neighbor, unless it's done for the proper improvement of the neighbor. In other words, to help them improve their reputation, to improve their life. Rather, we shall use our tongue to speak only the best about all people, to cover sins and infirmities of our neighbors, to justify their actions, to cloak and veil them with our very own honor. There is nothing around us or in us that can do greater, do greater good or greater harm in temporal or spiritual matters, Luther says, than the tongue. This little muscle, the smallest and weakest member. Luther reminds us, our chief reason for doing this is that Christ has gave us in the gospel and in which he means to encompass all the commandments concerning the neighbor, to live horizontally. And he says this at the end of the Eighth Commandment. And everything do to others as you would have them do unto you. That is living horizontally, with the cross ever before us. Next week, 
the last two. Amen. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. By the power of the Holy Spirit, let us pray to God our Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, making intercession for the church, the world, and for all people according to their need. Heavenly Father, thank you for entrusting us with the mission of spreading the gospel throughout the world. Thank you for the Holy Spirit, who reminds us of everything Jesus has taught. Thank you for your son's grace and forgiveness when we fall short. And thank you for the promise to give us his strength and authority, which is sufficient for all our needs. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your son sent the 70 to announce your kingdom's close approach. We pray for the church across the earth. Grant that in the power of the Spirit, it sows your word in many hearts. Let it correct, encourage, comfort, and instruct sinners gently. May it reap a harvest of salvation in Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Make this congregation eager to worship, pray, and serve. Help us to endure rejection and to focus on the joy in heaven over each sinner who repents and turns to Jesus in faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As a mother comforts her children, we pray that you would comfort your persecuted church. Give it gentle and valiant faith so the hearts of its tormentors may be softened with repentant repentance and remorse. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you for our country, especially as we celebrate the blessings of independence, liberty, and justice for all. Guide us, especially our elected leaders, in pathways of righteousness and truth. Let us continue to be a beacon of freedom for the world. Lord, in your mercy, we pray that all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit may know that your kingdom has indeed drawn near to them. Especially we remember Paul B., Paul H., Doug, J., John, Jesse, Brian, Phyllis, Janet, Alberto, Marilyn, Kayla, Martha, Sandra, Beverly, Pat, Alan, Kathy, Melissa, Haiti, Fred S., Carolyn, Judy, 
Harriet, Fred W., and those we name aloud and in our hearts. Give wisdom and competence to their doctors, nurses, and caregivers. Grant them healing and hope, so they may praise your awesome deeds. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, comfort your children who mourn the death of a loved one. Turn sorrow into rejoicing and despair into confident hope. Lead us into the full splendor of your kingdom, where with all the redeemed, we shall delight in praising and worshiping you forever. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please share this peace with one another. Requests from the choir. They're going to invite. They invite the congregation to stand and join them in singing verse three of hymn eight hundred and eighty-eight. When they get to that point in their anthem, thank you.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. For your goodness you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us in what we have gathered in the feeding of the world with your love. Through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed our duty our, and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, mighty, merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and the suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering then his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord and unite the wills of all who share in this heavenly food, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus, Jesus, Jesus Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Holy things for the holy. One is holy, one is Lord, Jesus Christ, in the glory of God the Father. Amen.
the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace and peace. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The God of all steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Jesus Christ. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace, believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And may Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. Please join us in our closing hymn. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.